Hello and welcome to another episode of Enter the Boardroom with New Role, the business-oriented podcast that brings the boardroom to your channel of choice. I'm your host, Oliver Cummings, CEO of New Role, the board-level hiring platform that specializes in the high-value chair, independent director, advisory board member, and trustee placements that drive high-impact boards. Today, I'll be speaking with Jane Ide, OBE, CEO of Akivo, the growing network of civil society leaders that works to develop skills and connection within the charity sector. Jane is currently also a trustee at the Social Investment Trust Access and the chair of trustees at Reach Volunteering. She was previously a non-executive director with the East Midlands Ambulance Service and executive director at the Driving Standards Agency. Jane's contributions to the charity sector have distinguished her as a devotee to social change. Her past leadership roles at charities such as Creative and Cultural Skills and NAFCA have seen her action several strategies for improving that this access social enterprises have to the resources they need to boost their impact and influence. Jane, thank you so much for joining the show today. Absolutely delighted to be here with you, Ollie. Thank you for inviting me. I'd love to start with your journey into the boardroom and really interested to hear the golden threads that link it together. I'm always slightly, there's something about people ask me about my journey as though it was something I planned. You know, I went along, I bought the ticket, I jumped on the train, I I got to my destination and here I am, you know, as a chief executive and board member and chair and all the other things that you, you highlighted. And it's not been like that at all. I have followed, I suppose, for the past 30 years, I've followed my passion, which was to help people communicate, to help people engage, to help people persuade and campaign and change the world in all sorts of different ways. And that has led me into doing roles that have, in one way or another, brought me into a board environment. And I suppose I was very, very fortunate that my very first proper role, my, my, you know, when I first really started my career working in a large organisation, was when I joined what was then Derbyshire Ambulance Service, which was a very small ambulance service at that time. And I was brought in to do some very specific and very exciting work around communications and stakeholder engagement and and lobbying government for change. And that meant that I was an associate director because that was the level of seniority I had to have in order to do that role and to provide some leadership around that particular function. And so that was my first experience of working, not formally as a member of the board, but alongside a board and seeing at first hand and working very closely with the chief executive, with the chair, with the non-executives and with the other executive directors. In so many ways, that was a fabulous training ground. And it kind of started me at that level of thinking, I think. So when I moved on from there eventually and and went into other roles, although it hasn't been a linear progression by any means, my career has been full of left turns, which is brilliant. That's really important to me, actually. But that meant that I could then feel, I won't say comfortable and I won't say at home, but I felt able to navigate working at board level or very very senior level in other large organisations. And so eventually that led to me having an executive director role in the Driving Standards Agency, which is an arm's length body of government, so a civil servant, which is a very interesting experience, different sort of governance again to the NHS. And then ultimately to finding myself almost by accident, well, actually literally by accident, really, working in the charity sector, having the opportunity to take on the chief exec role for an organisation that needed an entrepreneurial spirit, it needed turnaround, it needed change, it needed vision, and I knew I could do that. So I became the chief exec, and that was my first chief exec role. And it was never part of a plan. It was never a sort of determined intention that I was going to do that. But I landed on my feet. I found myself in a sector that I absolutely love working in, that I wish I'd joined sooner, in all honesty. Here I am, six, seven years later, I'm into my third chief exec role. And that has also opened opened up the opportunities for take, for me to take board roles as a volunteer, as a trustee, and now as a chair, which I know we'll talk a bit more about anyway in this conversation. But I think those have been hugely valuable opportunities. But it's really about taking the chances as they came in front of me, rather than any sort of planned intent to, to get to this space. Yeah, there was someone recently was saying to me, you can only join the dots when you look backwards. Uh, it sounds like... It's very like, true. Uh, it's yeah. very true. Yes, yeah. yes. So I'm really interested to understand how the boards that you had on that journey of, I suppose, and I guess it's been very different from your first year role to more recent ones. What was the role the boards played in that? And, and where did you get, where have you got most value from? Mm. Well, I suppose reflecting on that, I, I'll focus primarily, I think, on, on the work I've done in the 
in the civil society sector, charities, voluntary organisations, because we do have a very specific governance model and it is entirely different to the governance model that I've experienced in the NHS and the governance model I've experienced in the civil service and the governance model that you have in the private sector. And I think in our sector, it's very clear that the role of the trustee board is to provide scrutiny, to hold accountability, to take the ultimate responsibility for the organisation. And one of the challenges of being a chief executive in in this sector is that you feel that you carry that responsibility and yet you don't. So it's it's a very strange, to be honest, it's a slightly odd environment to be in in that respect. Whereas in the NHS, it's much more about the unified unitary board where there's that clear split between non-executive and executive, but everybody has a voice at the table, everybody has the vote, and there is that sense of really strong shared responsibility, which is something I've very much experienced now. It's quite difficult to get your head round when you first come into the, the sector or first come into that boardroom environment in our sector, because it's quite challenging to understand what you do and what you don't do as a chief executive. And I think it's really valuable when you have an experienced board or a largely experienced board who understand that and have a good sense of their own role and know where their boundaries are as well and don't try and get involved in being too operational but absolutely focus on that role of scrutiny of appropriate challenge but supportive challenge of understanding that they do have that shared responsibility for whatever happens we talk a lot in the sector about the classic we need a trustee who understands the finance And actually, you need a whole group of trustees that understand enough of the finance to be able to make sensible and legitimate decisions. And and the danger of leaving that responsibility with one individual when actually that's not the way the governance works. It's an interesting space to be in. It can be quite challenging. You know, it can inevitably be quite tricky. But my experience has been that by and large, the boards I've worked with, without exception as boards they have been intentionally supportive intentionally encouraging intentionally wanting to make sure that the organization can be the best it can be and recognizing that supporting the chief exec in in that endeavor is incredibly important and how has the experience of those boards changed for you over time as you've grown in experience as a as a CEO, I guess presumably the first first board role where you sort of you know landed in that role almost as you described it, it's been very different from now where you're coming in with that experience behind you and, and what you get out of them has changed. Very, very much so. I mean, when I look back, I'm now into my third chief exec role, even though that's not over that many years. I mean, I know many people in our sector who are perhaps still in what would technically be their first chief executive role, but they've been there six or seven years. They've built the same sort of experience, but in a different way. And I think, you know, when I look back, when I look back to my first board meeting, when I had my first chief exec role, it didn't help that I'd broken my arm three days beforehand. So I was completely zonked out on painkillers and not really able to prepare for it in the way I should have done. And I, I kind of flew it by, my, by the seat of my pants. And I think, you know, when I think now where I am, I'm literally in the process of preparing for a board meeting this week. And I'm much, much more conscious of the need to prepare properly to really understand the challenge for a trustee who may only, you know, the the board will only come together probably four times a year in our sector, generally speaking. That's the fairly common practice. They may or may not have very much to do with the organisation in between whiles. And so coming in, being asked to make intelligent, sensible choices and decisions that could have really quite long-term impact and will inevitably have real impact on our beneficiaries, on the people that we're working for and on the the organisation as a whole. I think there's a really important role for us as chief executives to understand what it is we need from them, to think about how we can best help them prepare. So one of my absolute golden rules, I will not compromise on this, is the papers have to go out a week before. They certainly have to go out with a weekend before the meeting so that people who are giving up their time voluntarily, who are doing busy day jobs or having very busy lives, do at least have the opportunity 
to read those papers. And that sounds like a really basic bit of housekeeping. And I know for a lot of larger organisations where they might have a member of staff whose job it is to, to manage all of these things and make sure everything runs like clockwork and will insist on all the directors providing their board reports by the you know 13th of the month sort of thing that's almost happens without noticing but in a smaller organization and the majority of charities are smaller organizations that's something you have to think about that's something you have to make happen it's something you have to diarize and it's just a simple bit of housekeeping but it's a, it's a signifier i think of that courtesy and respect that you need to pay your board to enable them to give their real insight and and to add value to those conversations so that's just one example I think I've matured and come to understand much better how that relationship can work and where you need to to spend time spending time investing in those relationships is incredibly valuable my first board I didn't actually spend time getting to know each individual trustee I got to know them over a period of time as a group my second role that was the first thing I did because I'd realized how helpful it was for me to know actually a bit more just a bit more about what their day jobs were about what their priorities were about what their interest was why why were they here not in any sort of manipulative way but just so that actually I would understand better where their particular areas of concern would be how I could reassure them how I could use them to to help guide me that's very much I think something I've brought into my third role that understanding of how enormously valuable your trustees are to you and how much value there is in investing that time in those relationships and getting to understand where their particular priorities lie in all sorts of ways. Super interesting. I mean, that actually resonates a lot. I, I think about you know my own experiences as a, a board member where I'll be sort of actively thinking about, you know, how can I add value to this organization? And then you sort of, you pile in with your thoughts. And I like to think of myself as a pretty engaged board member. And now of course, sort of sitting on the other side of the table as a CEO, actually you've got the issues that you're wrestling with that you'd most like to, to get board member input on. But of course, actually what you sort of see as a, as an operator, as a CEO is that different board members interact in different ways, or at least my experience is different board members interact in different ways and some wait to be asked and others sort of pile in. And actually what I sort of feel like I'm learning is I have to be much more structured about the way I invite and encourage them to participate to get the most out of them because otherwise you'll get some who'll just sit back and wait to be asked and others who'll pile in but on stuff that's that's not helpful and and i think some of the most valuable board members are those who kind of help you through that journey who sort of make sure that you're thinking about how do you get the most value out of them and encouraging you to do that rather than you know shaping the agenda of what's important to them if that makes sense but what are there things like that that have you over time you've started to see where you get most value out of individual board members that they do particular or other board members you can point to over time who've done things where you thought oh that was actually fantastic yes absolutely and i think you're absolutely right it's partly that simply getting to know one of the challenges i think when you're you're the chief executive in a board meeting is that you are on almost all the time you know there may be you may have a head of finance who presents the finance papers or you may have a guest speaker or whatever it is but the rest of the time you are on you're on stage and what that means is you don't have the opportunity to sit back and observe ah so he's a reflector he likes to have had time to think about it he'll come in with a question at the end or she's the person that thinks on her feet but she's always got that challenging you know click 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 thinking or you know whatever it is and and that does make it harder to to then understand where people are coming from. And you find yourself in that position where you are reacting in that moment. So, again, I think that's one of the things I've learned over the years is, again, spending that time thinking about it. But also never, ever forget the importance of the role of the chair in this, because the relationship between chief executive and chair in our sector is probably one of the things we talk about most and is absolutely crucial to the effectiveness or otherwise of that relationship between non-executive and executive. And part of one small part of that, you know, there's there's a whole range of things around the chair's role in this, but but actually the chair's role in making sure that every trustee is enabled to contribute is asked to, you know, what questions they may have, making sure things are included inclusive, especially in a world now where so many of us have moved to hybrid board meetings so you know you may have half your board in the room and the other half are online all of those sort of quite 
practical challenges, but those really make a difference. And the conversations that as a chief executive you have with your chair outside of the board meeting, I think there's a there's a really interesting, very fine line, but if you get it right, it works beautifully well in terms of your preparation. So you never want to, be, and you never absolutely never should be in a position where you and the chair are sitting down, you've nailed everything down, you've sorted out exactly what the answer is going to be, and it's just right, okay, we're going to manipulate the meeting to make this happen. That is absolutely not good governance, and I would never, I'd never want that, to be honest. But there is real value in having those conversations that you should, as a chief exec, be having with your chair on a regular basis outside of the board conversations that talks through where do you think the pressure points are? Where do you think the concerns are? What am I worried about as a chief executive? What does my chair think other trustees will want or will not want? How regularly do you speak with your chairs? And has that always been the same over all your roles or has it varied? It's actually, it's been relatively consistent with one or two. I've, I mean, I've worked, I've worked with several chairs actually across three roles for all sorts of different reasons. And, and every one of them is different. But I think the thing that's been consistent by and large with the majority of them has been a regular flow of communication. So with my current chair, we meet face-to-face monthly. We stay in touch. We were swapping messages on Teams just an hour ago, you know, about various things, not necessarily to do with the board meeting, although that's obviously what's coming up this week. And I think one of the, the absolute basic rules that I've agreed with every chair I've worked with and that I have now brought into my own chairing is no nasty surprises. I don't want to put my chair in a position where they feel they've been hung out to dry by something that they weren't expecting to know about and all of a sudden I'm talking about it in a board meeting and what are they supposed to do with that and equally I don't expect my chair to hang me out to dry either you know if they've got a concern if they've got a worry if they've got a problem if they've got something they're not happy about the way I'm talking about it or planning on presenting it or whatever it is I expect us to have had that intelligent adult conversation beforehand and when I was talking and again it comes back to it sounds it sounds so silly because it sounds quite bureaucratic but when I was talking about making sure you've got the papers out the week beforehand that's about respect for your trustees but the process of preparing those papers and the work that goes into actually what's going to be on the agenda what are you actually trying to say here why are you saying that why are you bringing this decision now what are you asking for where are the pinch points? Where are the bear traps in all of that? Again, and it's difficult because there comes a point when you're trying to prepare this so far in advance of the meeting that actually, you know, you can't do that because you've got to be reactive in the, in, in what's actually happening in the few weeks beforehand as well. But the more you can have those conversations with your chair, the more you gain the advantage of their insight and their wisdom and their perspective, and the better you will be prepared to go into that conversation. And that's what makes helps make really good governance perhaps there's two things about governance for me one is one is about risk it's all about risk at the end of the day it's all about management of risk but the other thing is is about preparedness and there's a responsibility on both sides of the table for the executive to have done all the preparation and made it possible for others to do the reading in advance and then for the trustees to have come into that meeting as well prepared as they possibly can be and we all understand you know that that there are going to be times when you know for whatever reason they haven't been able to read every paper in detail or they haven't had the opportunity to 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 talk about it in advance or whatever it is they might need to do but by and large that's part of the job that's part of what you sign up for as a trustee and we're not asking that much of people's time to do that if we're if we're sensible but it's what makes all the difference for in terms of a, a, a really good shared responsibility for the for the good of the organization which is what it all comes down to at the end if you're sort of looking at the other side of the coin there of board members that you work with who've been an absolute pain in the backside high friction negative value add yeah what are the sort of hallmarks there that you've been most scarred by i would genuinely say i've been fortunate that i almost never had anybody in that category almost never And certainly the vast majority of trustees that I've worked with have very much not been in that space. They've been the opposite. I think the challenge that I've experienced is when, well, there's two sides to it. Well, two aspects of the same thing. I did once have somebody that I was trying to work with who was so determined to try and be operational. Effectively, it felt like they actually wanted to be doing my job. And that was very, very difficult to to manage and we managed it and eventually there was a conversation and that was dealt with 
I think on a more general basis, I've been very fortunate in many ways, but it's a little bit of a two-edged sword that because particularly when I was at NAVCA, which was also a membership body in the in the or is a membership body in the sector, and here at Akivo, the majority of our trustees are elected from within our membership. And that has meant very specifically at Akiva, because we are a membership body for chief executives, but also at NAVCA, that it wasn't quite as specific or explicit there, but it was very much the case. That meant that in both of those circumstances, the majority of my board members have themselves been chief executives of charities. That can be incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful, because they have wisdom, they have experience, they know exactly what you're trying to deal with. And even just you know, a week ago, I had a conversation with a couple of our trustees and I was saying, you know, I'm really wrestling with this particular issue and, you know, we've got some challenges coming up and I don't quite know how we're going to do with it. And one of them said, well, I'm having this conversation with my own exec team and this is what we're going to do. And you might want to think about that. Brilliant. Really, really helpful without ever overstepping the mark into actually what I think you should do is, which is not helpful. The flip side is a little bit of that, that sometimes I've had the experience where because somebody is a chief executive of a charity and of a member charity, they've seemed to come with that view that actually the organisation I was managing should be managed in the same way as their organisation should be managed without really recognising that whilst they may be and were running a fantastic organisation, it was in a very different context because actually they were a member of our body, but they were not a membership body. And so that could cause a few challenges, particularly when it came to things like budget decisions, you know, sort of, well, we haven't got somebody who does that role, so why should you have somebody who does that role sort of conversation? And and quite, that got quite challenging and quite difficult occasionally. So, yeah, I, I think I've been very fortunate, though, because as I say, that's always been balanced, always been balanced by some unbelievably wise people who, I mean, I, th- I think back to my first board and, you know, a couple of people on that board, one in particular, who I would still turn to now for advice or guidance and still do. Very, very experienced in the role that he had in his day job. Very experienced as a trustee. Very good at that stepping back and saying hang on a minute folks we're trying to do Jane's job here for her let her do the job what we need to do is provide that strategic shaping or 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 oversight and scrutiny and so on and that's hugely valuable hugely valuable and I hope that as a trustee I can do the same for the chief execs I work with interesting I mean my experience you sort of get different people I'm reading the advice trap recently which is a sort of coaching classic and, you know, sometimes when I've worked with coaches or board members who only ever ask questions, I'm sitting there sort of, I start to get frustrated. I'm like, just tell me what you think. Stop asking these <laughs> questions. And, and when, when they do it badly, they start making what I call questions, which are suggestions dressed up as questions. But equally, you sometimes get board members who never tell you what they think and they, they never give you any sort of guidance or they always agree with you and they'll sit there and go, well, that sounds sensible to me. And actually Mm -hmm. they're not even kind of opening up the option set or they're not giving you a sort of enough of a push. Where do you find you get most value from your board members? Is there a particular profile type? Those who are sort of just asking questions, those who are sort of take more of a direct stance or do you find you get value across the spectrum? I think if you're fortunate with your board, and if if you're not, then you have to think about how is your board made up and what needs to change. If you're fortunate with your board, what you actually have around that table is that magic that comes from having the combination of all of the above, in a way. I don't think I've ever, no, that's not true. I was going to say I've never had a board trustee that's not expressed an opinion. Possibly I have in one instance where maybe a couple of trustees just didn't they were always fairly quiet and didn't didn't really seem to sort of say very much about the issues but but again I think that's partly down to chairing and you know that's the responsibility of the chair and the responsibility of whatever your process is for appointing trustees to be thinking about that and being very clear that everybody there should have a voice does have a voice whatever part of the challenge I think sometimes is particularly for trustees who are coming in from other sectors or from other backgrounds they don't necessarily feel very confident to speak out that's a big challenge that's something that has to be tackled because 
they can't deliver on their responsibility if they don't feel able to ask a question. And that whole principle about, you know, there's no such thing as a silly question, actually, I think is it's very true. In a, quite often I found myself in board environments, particularly those where I've been a non-exec in, in other sectors where I don't know the the sector so well. Actually, my role has been I'm the one that's going to ask the silly question because it's the one, it's the obvious thing that everybody else has forgotten to ask, you know, and that that can be hugely valuable. And I think when I've experienced that with a trustee or with another board member, it opens up a conversation. The most valuable interventions I've ever had have always been from somebody who has listened carefully, done the thinking, you know, been engaged in the whole process and then asks a question that just opens up a different angle, something that nobody else has thought about that I haven't thought about. Because I think that's the thing as well is that there's a, there's always a feeling, I think, inevitably as a tra- chief exec, that you're going into the dragon's den, you know, and that you're going to be put on the spot about whether you really know what you're talking about or have you done the right thing and all the rest of it. And actually, I have learned and I'm continuing to learn that that's not what it's about. It is about or it shouldn't be what it's about if that is what's happening with your board then you seriously need to think well there's a lot of good neuroscience behind that isn't there once you put someone into fight or flight mode their intelligence levels drop so you're not going to get the best out of them it's mad exactly that's right and again in the sector we do see some bad behaviors from boards you know that 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 they seem to think or some individuals they seem to think they're there to to challenge and point the finger and to you know exactly interrogate that's not particularly helpful for anybody but I think it is much more, and, and I've come to understand this better having been a trustee or having become a trustee myself and then reflecting on, well, as a trustee, I want to ask this question. I'm not trying to trip the chief executive up. I genuinely just want to ask the question. And so I start to be much more understanding of where my trustees are coming from. And I think it is that thing of they just want it to be the best it can be. And actually, I'm a huge believer that wherever you get that challenge or that scrutiny from, whether it's from your executive team or whether it's your staff or whether it's your trustees, if it's done with good intent, and we have a real principle at Akivo that we start with the assumption of good intent. That's that's a key part of our internal culture. And we start with that assumption of good intent. And therefore, it will nine times out of 10, it will help us make a better outcome. And one time out of 10, if it doesn't, it's because... It's not actually added anything that we haven't thought about, but that's absolutely fine. That's quite a nice place to be sometimes. So, yeah, there's a really valuable role for a good trustee to play. You've talked, I suppose, on that, that note in the past about, I think, one of the leaders you've learned most from is an individual called Lucy Straker, one of the mm-hmm. driving forces behind Charity So Straight. You cited as the most intrinsically inclusive person you know yeah. how you learn from her every time you speak with her mm-hmm. what have been the key insights that you've picked up there and, and elsewhere that you think sort of board members can learn from because it strikes me that that sort of inclusivity a lot of things you've just touched on there around you know not having a challenge fight or flight environment making people comfortable voicing their stupid questions all goes to that inclusivity yeah. question well i suppose i mean the first thing i would say is actually and I don't want to embarrass her, and she will be horribly embarrassed to hear this because she's she is naturally quite a – she likes to be a bit more behind the scenes, does our Lucy. But I think the first thing I would say is simply the fact of learning from Lucy because I got to know Lucy when I first went to Navca. She was part of the team there. I got to work alongside her. She then left and went into something else, and then later on she came back again. And we've, you know, we've become friends over the years. And I think – the first thing I would say to any board is do not assume that you will only get the best insights from the senior team that's sitting around your table. You can get those insights from anywhere if it's from somebody who's intelligent or thoughtful or has something to bring. And that kind of becomes part of the principle of that inclusivity. One of, Again, one of the conversations, one of the debates that is ongoing in our sector and is very live is how do you bring different perspectives around your board table? And in fact, I was at an event only last night and talking briefly, not as long as I'd have liked to have done, with the chief executive of the Young Trustees Movement organisation. And, you know, whether it's bringing in younger people, whether it's bringing in people with the lived experience of the cause that you work in as a charity, whether it's homelessness or refugees or, you know, any number of domestic violence, any number of the other things that might be relevant for that, 
whether it's about race diversity, whether it's about LGBT plus diversity, disability, all of those different aspects of humanity, all of those different intersectional experiences that people have can bring something new to your board table. Now, I absolutely don't want people to think it's a tick box exercise. You know, we have to have one disabled person, one gay man, one black woman. That is a horrendous way of approaching it. And I think we're past that now in the sector. By and large, we're past that now in the sector. But I do think there's there's still a challenge for boards to, first of all, to really grasp what they're missing. And there was a really interesting, and I really wish I kept the reference and I never did. And I'll have to try and find it somewhere. It was something I you know, probably saw it on social media or whatever. But a piece of research that was published sometime last year, I think it was, which was about decision making by people working in a second language and how much better their decision making was than people working in their native language and immediately I thought well you know I've got people around my board table I've got people around my team who are constantly having to think in a second you know and and work in a second language and translating and so on and so forth I thought brilliant I've got all these brilliantly good decision makers you know around me now that wasn't a deliberate we must go and get people who are, you know, native French speakers or native Italian speakers or native Portuguese speakers or whatever it is, because if they come and work with us in English, they'll be better decision makers. But it's definitely a flow on from that, I think, as well. And again, one of the beauties and one of the challenges I've experienced in my experience with boards, one of the challenges has been when actually there's been a bit too, hom- too much homogeneity, that having come from within a membership body, they've come from kind of the same sort of background and kind of the same way of thinking. And that can bring a a real sense of unity and commitment to the cause and the shared vision. But it does mean it's much harder then to get that challenge and that different way of thinking. Whereas, again, you know, in my current board, there's a lot of diversity. Quite deliberately, the board has been developed to be one of the most diverse boards I've ever worked with. And we're very proud of our track record on that. But we have to keep maintaining that. Is that just about the people that you've got on it, or is there something that you're doing with the dynamics of the? When, you know, once you've got a diverse range of people, like how do you foster the sense of inclusivity and belonging? Well, I think that's a that's a really good question because I think it's something I'm thinking about in terms of my staff team as well. Bearing in mind, I've only been at Kivo six months now, so I'm still I'm still understanding the history of some of this stuff and and how this has come about and what still needs to be done. It's certainly something I'm thinking about, as I say, in terms of the staff team, and I think it's probably true of the board as well, that there's been a lot of effort and intentionality put into making sure that we are open to diversity. And we have had and still have some very clear targets set because, again, when you're recruiting trustees, if you're not clear about what you're looking for, you're not going to get it. And being very open to, very clear in our communication about our openness, because there is still there is still a very strong sense in our sector. Going back to Lucy, the reason you know the reason Charity So Straight exists and its sort of sister campaign about queer trustees is that there is still far too much of a sense that they don't mean me, they don't want me. I wouldn't feel comfortable in that space, and I think whether it's in terms of staff teams or whether it's in board, in terms of boards, the whole thing really hinges on, okay, you've got the idea that you need more diversity and all the value and the benefits and the and the rightness of doing that. You've done all the work or you've done a lot of the work about how you make that happen, you know, your inclusive recruitment processes and being very open and being very explicit and all of those sorts of things. Have you actually done the work about what that experience is like for them when they arrive? And I remember in my previous role at Creative and Cultural Skills, we had a, a brilliant, in inverted commas, young trustee. She'd been recruited as a younger trustee. And she was so articulate about some of the challenges that she'd faced coming onto the trustee board, which included really practical things like, of course, we pay your expenses. You pay your... She, she had to fly down from Edinburgh to go to London to board meetings pre-pandemic. Of course, we'll pay your expenses. We pay them in arrears, so if you can just book that very expensive plane ticket and then claim it back and we'll pay it back for you within the next month sort of thing. And, you know, she was saying, you can't do that when you, you know, you haven't got the the wherewithal to do it. The conversation last night about young trustees was very much about, well, timings of board meetings. If you're a younger person, you 
almost guaranteed you'll you know if you're working you won't have the power to say actually I'm going to take a couple of hours out in the middle of the day is that all right mate yeah fine you know you'll lose time or you'll lose pay or you'll lose credibility so how do we manage that if you're a parent with young children you can't you know so if you've got a board which is made up of young people who can't take time out of the day job slightly less young people who've got young kids and can't spend their evenings and an exec team that you really don't want to be asking to work late on in the day when do you have your board meeting you know and these are really practical questions but if we don't grapple with them if as a whole board and it has to be a whole board conversation it can't come from the chief executive and it shouldn't do on their own and it shouldn't come just from the chair that won't work it has to be a whole board conversation but it has to have some clarity about okay we're going to have to make some compromises here which are the areas we're going to compromise on and and why does this matter what does this do for us so there's some real challenges there but there are so many benefits and so much to be gained if we get it right one one other thing that actually strikes me we started doing these uh, peer-to-peer support forums for board members and one of the really interesting things is how vulnerable many board members feel but don't mm-hmm. share that with yes. their fellow board members and so they're carrying all this anxiety and fear either sort of insecurity about their own ability to add value and they're being looked at for sort of experience and wisdom or that there's a dynamic at work that they're not comfortable with and so many of them have it. and it's this wonderful moment when you get them together and they all realize actually I'm, I'm not alone and it's, it strikes me as something we could we could do more of on boards to bring that out because you know it's the same as in, in an exec team when people uh, you know are open with those things and there's a balance to strike but suddenly actually it enhances the the dynamic of the the collaborative piece in my my experience couldn't agree more and i think it depends where you're at in your life journey when you become a trustee for the first time or you join a board for the first time whether to be honest whether it's executive or non-executive i think the more experience you've got the better able you are you know i know there are some people who might step onto their first trustee board and they know the value they're bringing they have got the career behind them they're absolutely no question they've, they've got past any queries qualms they might have but i agree i think the vast majority of trustees in my experience you know they do feel a little bit nervous because it's quite a big thing when all said and done. You know, it's it's an important role. It's It's got a lot of responsibility attached to it. I'm not a fan of the phrase imposter syndrome, but I do think none of us are born into it. Mm. You know, nobody is born being a trustee or being a, a member of the board. That familiarity, that exactly as you say, that understanding that actually it's normal to not know what's going on around you. You're, you're being asked, well, you're back to the point, you know, you're being asked to understand the context and the implications of an organization that usually you probably won't know that well and even if you do know it that well the chances are you've got to change your mindset because if you've been a former member of staff there or if you've been a beneficiary there you've got a different relationship with it and you've got to shift your thinking because you're now in a, in a governance role I mean I remember when I and I should probably be careful about saying this in public but when I first became a trustee it was with the Access Foundation which is a fantastic organization and I love being a trustee there it took me probably a year to start to feel that actually I could add any value I mean I spent the first year thinking I don't know why they've appointed me because I don't know which is terrible which is terrible it's a sort of wasted wasted year no 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 no, I don't mean it like that but I just I, I, I don't think it was a wasted year at all I think it was just it kind of made me work hard to bring value it was very much that sort of thing of this is, you know, this is quite complex financial investment mm. stuff. It's it's not a straightforward charity in that regard to, to kind of get your head around. And just that process of learning to be a good trustee, you can't shortcut it. You might be lucky, it might happen sooner or later, but you can't shortcut it. But But actually, I'm so glad that I didn't let that make me feel like, oh, perhaps, I, perhaps I'm in the wrong place, perhaps I ought to go. Mm. Because if I'd done that, I'd have missed out on that feeling of actually I do feel like I bring value and I love being part of that group of trustees and part of that is actually having the chance to get to know people and I think it's really important you know we don't always it's always a bit of a challenge you know how do you bring trustees together outside of a board meeting and 
what the practicalities are of that. But I do think it's really valuable. And having that chance to break bread together, having a meal together, having an away day together, having something that's a, a little bit outside of the formality of your standard board meeting agenda. Because again, it goes back to that's when you actually have those conversations and you start to realize, oh, actually, perhaps I'm not the only one even around this board table that actually isn't entirely sure of everything. And then, again, by and large, they're interesting people. You know, they are really interesting people that you want to spend time with. So, yeah, that's the sign for me of a, of a good board. Now, I'm really interested in your, you've had quite a wide range of experience across different governance mm. uh, sort of models. You know, you've been a, an associate and exec of an, an, an NHS trust, you've been a chair of school governors, you've been a charity chair and, and trustee. How have these roles varied? And I'm particularly interested, you know, if I'm sitting here as someone who's never taken on one of these roles, actually, which I, I have never taken on a charitable trustee role, how would you think about those different you know taking one of those on for the first time how would you sort of evaluate where to start i think they are all entirely different governance structures that's the first thing so of all of the roles that i've had school governor is probably the most if i'm really honest the most challenging and the least rewarding and i've heard many other former school governors say the same thing and that wasn't about the school and it certainly wasn't about the staff team who were absolutely lovely and it's my village school you know I've got huge huge respect for it and very glad it's there but the role of a school governor is really quite bounded you know particularly in in, in our particular instance you know it's a school where, where we were being asked to sign off on policies that had basically been written by the local authority there wasn't any room for change there wasn't really any room for real scrutiny so it became a very bureaucratic exercise and I think there was a a challenge as well there in the sense of as a governing body it was quite hard to see how much influence we could really have it kind of became to some degree it was an exercise in resisting things rather than actually setting a vision there was a lot of stuff around the culture and around you know, supporting the the head teacher and the staff, particularly because this was during the pandemic as well. And there was quite a lot of stuff about the practicalities of, you know, shall we put some money into buying some new equipment for the playground? But it wasn't that there wasn't that opportunity to set a vision to really look at the long term strategic growth of the school because it's so bounded by every other layer of bureaucracy around it. But I think having said that, the governors that I work with that found it most rewarding were the ones that had a direct stake or had had a very recent direct stake through their own children or through being part of the education system themselves. I didn't have either of those things. I was asked to join because I was a member of the village community and, you know, I was very happy to do that and I hope I provided some some valuable support. But if you haven't got that connection, that emotional connection, I think it's quite difficult. And I suspect the same is true of becoming a trustee of a charity as well because the truth is I think there's there's always a risk especially if you're outside of the sector and I probably would have fallen into this trap myself many years ago you know of thinking oh I'm going to go along and I'm going to help some nice people do some good things for some poor people and that's not what this is about this is about managing some really hefty risks some real challenges I don't think there's a charity I know, however big or small it is right now, that isn't really having to face up to the the challenges that lie ahead economically and what that means internally as an organisation, what that means strategically and what that means above all for the services or the work that you do in terms of your charitable objects. You have to feel that there's a reason for you to be there. And I think as well, by the same token, my experience as a non-exec in the NHS, that was in many ways much, much more demanding. I mean, more demanding in terms of time, apart from anything else, you know, monthly board meetings and and long board meetings that took basically the best part of a day, a lot of papers to read, committees to be part of, a lot of bureaucracy, obviously, and again, all the challenges that the NHS faces, and you can't run away from them when when you're sitting at that board table. The one difference being that that's the one place where you get financially rewarded for taking on that role. By the same token, I I always felt as an associate director there because I was being paid for my time. This is a job. You know, this is not something I can say, well, I'm really sorry, I can't come to that meeting. It's, yeah, you know, this this is as much a job as my day job was. So I think you have to really think about 
what are the types of governance that you're going to enjoy? Because if you're not enjoying it, you're not, you know, you're not going to stick with it. And that's no help to anybody. Where do you feel you can really add value? But also, where what are you going to get back out of it? Because I think, again, any voluntary role, which again, in our sector, is all our, all trustees are, well, almost without exception, all trustees are volunteers. But any volunteer has to have something back from it. You know, whether it's a sense of community or whether it's getting you out of the house at the end of the day or, you know, whatever it is. But I think at a governance level, you have to have some satisfaction that comes from it because we want our trustees to be in it for the long haul. You know, I think my experience and every charity will have different rules in the constitutions about this. But my experience of trustees is that they come on for a three year term. They're usually limited either to two terms or possibly three. I've never worked with a trustee board that's had more than three terms available you know and ideally you want people to be there for the six years because that gives you some some continuity but it also gives you the appropriate level of change and refreshment and it can be challenging because actually your board can change every year because you'll have a proportion that step down and step on so you're always in that sort of slightly churn feeling but that's what makes it a really viable board so we want people who are intentional or intending to commit for a, a good length of time and then for that to work obviously anything can happen you know you I've had board members have to step down because of ill health or because of bereavement or they've changed jobs or you know whatever it is and that's that's unfortunate but that's life you want to be able to give them something back in return for, for making that commitment to you super interesting lots of food for thought for those thinking about taking on those roles now mm. the other thing i'm really interested to understand your perspective on is you've recently transitioned into a chair role relatively mm-hmm. recently, and that's something that often comes up as a discussion point in these sort of peer-to-peer forums amongst experienced board members who are thinking about taking on the chair role you know how do they prepare for it are they right for it what have you learned from that transition that you think would be helpful for someone listening who's considering doing the same? I suppose, and again, it depends where you're coming from. So I'm coming from the perspective of somebody who has worked with five chairs in the sector. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of close observation, shall we say, of what I have felt has worked well for me as chief executive and what has worked less well. And I hope, you know, I've learnt, actively learnt from all of that and and I'm bringing that into my practice as as a chair. What would be your top three standout things of the sort of best practices that you've taken from those chairs? Best practices as a chair is know when to step in and when to step out. What that means in practice is as a chief executive, you need your chair to be available to you when you need them. You know, if you're if you're just having a really tough moment about something, if you've got a problem that you just can't resolve, if you urgently need to talk to them about some issue that's that's arisen you need them to be available you need to be able to have that communication with them and that's why it pays to have invested in those relationships and that communication early on but at the same time what you don't want and what you don't need is for them to be constantly pecking on your shoulder and saying right you know we haven't spoken for three days can you tell me what's happening about this now because you actually end up spending all your time servicing the chair's interest rather than actually getting the job done which is not helping so so I think there's an element of Knowing where to step in and step out, and part of that is knowing that you can trust your chief executive to do a good job. Again, I come back to if you don't feel able to do that, then there's a there's something you've got to tackle, you've got to work through. So I think that's the first thing. I think there's also that element of however experienced you are as a chief executive, there is something, you know, and you are the head of your organization you are the by definition whether you're a tiny organization of five people or even smaller than that or a massive organization of five thousand or even bigger than that for your staff you are that sort of the head of that pyramid for want of a better way of putting it but you've always got somebody who's sitting above you in the hierarchy and that's your chair and so you need to there has to be the relationship with the chair where that chair can give you feedback, can give you guidance, can give you some performance management if that's necessary. That's their job. And so having the ability as a chair to do that effectively without it ever feeling, or hopefully not feeling to that chief executive, that actually what you're doing is undermining them and what you're doing them is giving them a really tough time without realising that they're already having a really tough time or whatever it is. You know, Having that ability to effectively performance manage somebody that you don't 
spend your working day with, I think is quite a neat art. And again, I've been very fortunate in that and I've had some less fortunate experiences of that as well. What what is it what do you think good looks like? I mean, do you have a framework that you use or a mental model that you use for applying? I'll flip it back around again and at the risk of embarrassing her, my my current chair, Rosie, is incredibly good at being very clear about what she's looking for and where she thinks performance can improve while at the same time celebrating the really good stuff. And I think that comes from what I've I'm, and we're still in the process of getting to know each other, you know, but but I think that comes from that deep belief she has in the ability of all of us to develop our leadership skills and to be the best we can be. And I go back to that point I made earlier about starting with that assumption of good intent. I know that when she's giving me feedback, it's not because she wants to give me a hard time or she wants to peck at me or, you know, whatever it is. I know it's because she is absolutely committed to our organisation she wants our organisation to be the very best it can be, to be the most resilient it can be, to be the most strategic, most impactful, most influential in all the right ways that it can be. And that I've been appointed to make that happen. And therefore, she wants me to be the best I can be. And that's actually really energising because it's like, yeah, actually, I do want to be the best I can be. And I've got somebody here who's coming from a very different perspective, different background, different experience different viewpoints in all sorts of ways, but she is putting that into my development. And I'm really grateful for that because she's putting time and effort and energy into that. You know, I think that's a really important part of what the chair's role is to do. And then I think the third really good chair behaviour that I've seen and witnessed and been able to draw value from is the role of the chair in keeping the board as a unified without becoming homogenous group of people so that when you're coming into a board meeting there is a shared understanding of what you're there for a shared understanding of again the good intent a shared understanding of the purpose of what we're there to do that then gives you that framework within which people can question and challenge and ask you know the silly question or comment or pass opinion or whatever it is that they need to do because it is it's already set out as being we are here to support but challenge appropriately we're here to scrutinize we're here to guide we're here to enable and I think those those three things are the really important parts and if I can chuck a fourth one in just for the sake of it because again this is something I've I've talked about when I've when I've talked in panels about the relationship between chairs and chief executives and this is something I'm absolutely determined to bring into my own practice as a chair is don't ask a difficult question on a Friday afternoon (laughs) because chairs god bless them sometimes forget you know they'll have a busy week they'll have something that's niggling away at the back of their mind they keep thinking oh I must ask her that I must ask her that you finally get to Friday. I think, right, okay, I'm just going to drop you that email. And at the receiving end, you're just about to finish up at the end of a really tough week. And you're really hoping that just for once you can have a weekend to just clear your head. Because if you don't, you're not going to be able to do the job properly when you come back on the Monday morning. And this email arrives or this phone call comes or this text. And it's a fairly innocuous question from the chair's point of view. It's just, oh, can you just tell me what it is about why it is that the, bal- the budget hasn't balanced in the papers this week? And all of a sudden, boom. <laughs> boom. exactly boom so don't do it on a friday afternoon do it on a monday morning if it's so urgent that you have to share it on a friday afternoon then it's something you need to pick up the phone and have that urgent conversation about if it can wait till monday leave it till monday yeah that resonates so much i, I i'm guilty of that certainly have been in the past as a ceo never mind as a mm-hmm. board and i have learned to use the schedule send button so that things get exactly sent on that. monday at 9am yes. Um, yes yes so start start that. the week off rather than yeah finish the day yes and are there any sort of on the flip side of the coin, is there anything on the negative side that really stands out of view of, of the chairs or things that, you know, for people thinking about becoming a chair to avoid? You have to be mature enough and wise enough. And I don't mean mature in years by any means. I mean, mature in outlook to be aware of your own behaviours. I have certainly seen at very close quarters some appallingly bad behaviour from chairs who were, by their own mind, motivated by all the right reasons. You know, they wanted things to be the best they could be, but who 
simply were completely unaware of the impact their behaviour was having on the chief executive, on the staff team. And we do see this at Akivo, sadly. We provide a lot of support for our, our members on a one-to-one basis. And, and, and one of the regular recurring themes of people calling us saying, I just can't do this anymore, is bad behaviour from a chair. Egos. Egos. Sometimes it's about having come from a different background. I mean, some of the toughest things I've seen have been, you know, when the chairs come from perhaps a very, what you might call robust political background or a public sector background where there's there's just a different way of... of all challenge, uh, no support. Exactly. All challenge, no support, just not understanding the realities. I think as well, there can be a real challenge when a chair comes from, or a trustee comes from the private sector as opposed to the voluntary sector. Not that that's a bad thing, but you just need to be aware that it is different, that the culture is different, that the realities of life are different. I think it can be really difficult if you get, and this perhaps I've seen more happen with trustees in other organisations, not in my own, than with chairs, but I think the same thing is true, where you get people people who come in saying, well, I work in the private sector, you know, and, and I've come to help this rather amateurish operation understand how they can be much more efficient and generate a surplus and, you know, do good things. And, uh, you know, and of course, that's, that's arrogant, to be blunt, because if you want to know how to be really efficient and productive and generate the most amazing value, you can come and talk to the sector because we are the experts in that. But I think, you know, and I think whether it's about sector background or whether it's about scale you know and again if you're coming from a you know we get lots and lots and lots of trustees and I'm really glad we do because they can bring some amazingly valuable stuff to our sector but you know if you're getting trustees from one of the big accountancy firms for example it is different it is different and some of the expectations you might have of what your small executive team is capable of doing and the reality of what they're trying to juggle and the emotional impact. I think one of the things we don't necessarily talk about enough in our sector is it is, I'm not going to make a sweeping generalisation, not everybody in our sector is completely open emotionally and absorbing all the pain and suffering that we see around us. I don't mean that at all. But I do think the vast majority of people in our sector do have by definition, they have a higher awareness of the fact that life can be really tough for people. And when you're absorbing that sort of strain on a day-by-day basis, if every time you write a board paper, you've got at the back of your mind, or you're talking explicitly about the needs of your beneficiaries, and it's tough out there. If you're talking about, particularly if you're talking about some of the more difficult areas, whether it's mental health or suicide risk, or whether it's domestic violence, and the, you know, the impacts of those things, or homelessness or you know any of those really challenging subsectors so to speak there's an emotional toll on that and I think that can be harder trustees to understand because they are inevitably and quite rightly somewhat sheltered from that hopefully in their day day jobs and when they come in four times a year or maybe eight times a year if they're on a subcommittee or something like that they absolutely, in my experience, they absolutely will engage with that and they will and they will find it quite tough as well. But mm. they can go away from it, generally mm. speaking, in a way that the executive can't. So I think just having that awareness of that and paying attention to, again, I've seen a lot, boards generally, again, sweeping generalisation, generally in our sector, they want to do right by the staff team. They want to pay attention to well-being. That's one of the areas that they would normally scrutinise. You know, they they want to make sure, you know, everybody knows how hard it is to give a decent cost of living increase this year. That's a big discussion that's going on at the moment. And boards understand that and they want to do the best thing they can. They perhaps don't always pay the same attention to the well-being of their chief executive. uh, And I think the classic example I've seen of that and have experienced of that is going to the board saying we need to invest in a couple of extra staff you know we've got somebody over there that's going to be doing some income generation we've got somebody over there that's going to do some development and I've got this part-time admin role that will support me and which of the three is the one that will always get get kicked out and I had a, a great former colleague of mine actually who in the middle of a board meeting not one of my own said to the board you do realise if you don't put that role in, the chief executive is going to be gone within three months mm. because they are burning out. They are trying to manage their own diary. They're trying to juggle everything. They don't have anybody to, to ask to do this because they're trying to protect the rest of the team. 
And the board went, oh, God, we hadn't realised that, which is where it, all comes, it comes back to risk. That's the risk you have to manage. And, and I think sometimes people can assume that these things are a luxury. But if the chief exec is asking for a role like that in these circumstances, there's a good chance they need it. There's a good chance they need it, yeah. That's Jane, the time has flown by and uh, it's uh, unfortunately yes. time to move on to the wrap-up. Um, so I'm going to start with the pass-along question, which is from a previous guest, if you're ready, and then we'll move on to the five-question quickfire. Okay. So the pass-along question is, what needs to change about board recruitment to see more substantial boardroom diversity in the charity and corporate sectors? Well, that's a really good question, isn't it? And one we've touched on, I think, already. So I think I think what needs to change and what needs or what needs to develop, because it's already starting to change, is first of all, getting the board on board, if you'll excuse the pun, with why it should be more diverse and what the value and the benefit is to the beneficiaries and to the organization. And a very wise person once said to me, any conversation with the board should always come back to what's going to happen for the beneficiaries. And you can never go wrong with that. So have that conversation about why it would be, be valuable. Once you've done that, then you can start to really interrogate what does that diversity need to look like? What, who's not in your room? How does that reflect your community, your beneficiaries, your intent? It doesn't have to be just about getting lived experience. There's all sorts of different ways of cutting this cake, but thinking about it. Then you have to think about how you are intentionally going to go out and find those people because they will not just appear out of nowhere. You have to go out looking. And a bit like anybody that's putting on a panel discussion and, you know, oh, we we can't find any speakers who aren't white. Well, yes, you can. You're just not looking hard enough. So go and look a bit harder. You know, same thing with trustees. Or potential trustees and then the really crucial really really crucial thing because if you don't do this it will not work and it will last not last and you will end up doing more harm than good is you have to think about what are the barriers going to be intentional or otherwise how do you dismantle those barriers how do you remove the hurdles how do you make it possible for somebody coming into your boardroom whose face literally may not fit who will not be seeing themselves represented because by definition that's what you're trying to tackle how do you make sure that this works for them and that you are enabling and supporting them to be the best trustee they can be rather than them feeling that they just buy a whole series of small things like not paying your expenses up front or you know having your trustee meetings at the wrong time or throwing away comments that people can make or whatever it is it might be what are those structural things that will actually make those individuals just feel that they're not really wanted? Because what will what will happen if you don't is that they will go and not only will they go and probably never come back again, that experience will add to the experience of their community and their community will become even more distanced from us and we will never nail this issue. That's what I would say in response to that question. Brilliant. Five question quick fire. So I'm going to say a, sh- a statement and ask you for a short response if you're ready. Okay. So best book every board member should read and why? Oh, well, so I'm not going to go. It's always tempting when you're asking about best book. I want to go down a really into let you know some heavy tome in. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to nominate a book that was written by a fabulous woman in our sector called Deborah Orcott tyler She's the chief executive of the Directory for Social Change. And she has written a whole series of books that, you know, are very accessible, very easy to read, but actually really nail some of the issues. And one in particular is called It's a Battle on the Board. And I would recommend that because for so many of our trustees and chairs, they are people who are coming from very different backgrounds, don't have a lot of time necessarily. As I say, it's a straightforward read, but it's got some really deep truths in it about some of the challenges and tensions that can happen around a board meeting, around a board table, and how you tackle them. It's well worth having on your bookshelf. Sounds great. Not read that one. We'll add it to my list. And your favourite quote and why? My favourite quote, well, my favourite current quote is one that I actually have got pinned on my wall. I came across it about six months ago and it really, really resonated with me. And I've shared it a few times and it resonates with other people. It's actually Mark Twain. I mean, Mark Twain's always good for quotes anyway. But he wrote, I'm an old man and have known a great deal of troubles, but most of them never happened. And I love that because it's just that reminder that we spend an awful lot of our time in life as well as in work, meeting trouble halfway preempting things that you know worrying about this worrying about that and then actually they don't happen and I don't think there's an easy answer to it but it's just a lovely reminder to me that 
actually, you know, I am eventually going to be an old an older woman than I am now. And I will look back and realise, as I already do, that I've wasted an awful lot of my time worrying about things that just haven't happened and what I could do with that energy instead. Love it. Your best ever holiday and why? <laughs> it's always going to be the last one you've just had or the one you're about to have. I think actually genuinely I had a fantastic holiday earlier this year. And one of the reasons it was fantastic was, was first of all, it was three weeks long. And I'm a huge believer in a three week holiday if you can do it, because your first week you are literally just shedding everything. And the second week you start to relax. And then if you come home at that point, you just haven't quite. But the third week, oh, that is joy. You really get the value out of it. So that's the first thing. And I think particularly I was incredibly lucky this year. We we were able to go away. We went to France and travelled around a bit and had some lovely weather and it was all fantastic. But the thing that was really special about it was that just by the way things landed in terms of timing, I was able to go on holiday having left my previous role and knowing that I was going to be coming back to this role and this is my dream job. So I was in the best possible place. I had nothing to worry about. I had no responsibilities, but I knew what I was coming back to do. And I'll probably never get that one again. It was special. It was really good. Sounds fantastic. Your most uh, significant professional insight? Oh, God. It's okay to get it wrong. Because I think the more senior you are, the more you feel that responsibility to always get it right, to, to have all the answers, to solve everything. Something I've been writing and talking about with our members just this week is is particularly in times of crisis, that feeling that we have to be the lifeboat, we have to rescue everybody, we have to save everybody. Actually, we can't do that. And again, very wise insight I got from three different people, including two of my trustees. We can't be the lifeboat, we have to be the lighthouse and we have to guide people give them that sense that there is somewhere they can go to that is safe out of the storm but we can't solve the problem for them and i think pretty much every chief exec i've ever known has just what they just want we just want to get it right we don't want to get it wrong but we will sometimes and that's okay because that's human and forgive yourself when you do last but not least your favorite podcast and why well you mean apart from this one <laughs> absolutely apart from this one <laughs> Well, I've got, I've got, I can't, I cannot not answer that question by giving a plug to the Akiva podcast because we do host our own podcast. We have conversations with members and with other leaders. And I genuinely love it because I get to host that when I get to be in your shoes. And what we've recently started doing, and I'm very keen that we do a lot more of this, is, is a walking, talking podcast. So rather than sitting in a studio or, you know, on a laptop or whatever, and, and I think these conversations can be enormously rich, but there is something very special. You know, anybody that's got kids or been in this situation, that thing about if you're sitting in the car and they're not looking at you and they'll talk in a different way. It's the same thing when you can get a cheap exec going out on a walk. And I've got a brilliant little bit of kit. It's just a couple of little earphones, microphones that plug into my phone and you know we're at sort of like six feet we're, we're it's like an umbilical cord but it gives us plenty of room to be able to move around and talking to a fellow leader in a space or a place that matters to them walking enjoying the environment responding to what's going you know whether it's ducks on the river or a lorry going past whatever it is there's something just really rich about those conversations people open up in a different way and they feel more relaxed so they feel better able to talk and they're not feeling tense and worried about what's this going to sound like. So I'm loving doing those and I'm really looking forward to doing a lot more of those next year. There's going to be a lot of walking and talking in my world next year, I hope. And so, yeah, I hope other people enjoy listening to it as much as I enjoy doing it. Wow, fantastic. Jane, it has been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for being such a great interviewer, Ollie. I've really enjoyed it.